So in terms of what I, well, first, it's clear that for many classes of problems, we need meshes of multi-millions of elements. And that's even in the case of using the best of adaptive methods uh, in terms of methods that try to reduce the total number of uh, finite elements fi or finite volumes that, that you're using in this. And the methods we'll be talking about here on non-structured meshes are almost all exclusively integral-based methods since they allow you more the uh, higher flexibility in, in the mesh topology and also as commented uh, previously and uh, methods of dealing with higher order discretizations uh, and trying to localize that if you want or not localize it if you want to do uh, isogeometric types of methods. Um, so we need efficient algorithms that can work with these meshes and the thing that has been changing it's not just a phenomena of exascale, but it's a more a phenomena of simply problem sizes growing as we've gone from Terra to Peta, et cetera, is you can't have your workflow start off on one machine and then you switch to another and switch to another. We're, we have to be able to work in parallel from the beginning, um, and you'll see that in some of the examples. In terms of what I will talk about, I will talk about the issues of supporting unstructured meshes on parallel computers. Much of that I'm going to do very quickly because these, I'm talking about essentially the same types of technologies that Tim Tauge has covered in, uh, in more detail yesterday in terms of a parallel mesh infrastructure. I'll just highlight a couple of the high level aspects of that. Uh, some of those things and talk about some of the what we refer to as services that we provide for dealing with the meshes. I won't talk about actually doing the, the, mesh, the individual mesh level operations. So that'll be things like what are the representations, how do you do dynamic load balancing, how do you adapt the mesh. Um, and I believe that'll hopefully answer one of the questions that came up before. I'll then talk about how we are integrating these with a variety of analysis packages in a component-based method on large-scale parallel computers with a focus on the recent work we're doing with the Albany code, which is a part of the Trilinos package. It's an open source code that uh, can do a variety of physics, has linkages to UQ, et cetera, uh, and now is developing linkages to adaptive analysis by the, the joint work uh, with Glenn Hansen. Uh, in which that will also be demonstrated. And I'll comment a little bit on the hands-on session, although there'll be more information as we go along. So what are the components I'll talk about? Most of what you've heard when you think about uh, this, you think about the actual finite element or finite volume solvers, the procedures that take and form the discrete set of equations over meshes and then solve those. But in fact, if I wish to do a parallel simulation over complex geometries, and I'm, there's a focus here on being able to do, deal with arbitrary complex geometries that can come from CAD systems, image data, whatever, and with methods that I'm very concerned about being faithful to the boundary of the geometry. So that, that lead, pushes us heavily towards the unstructured meshes and methods. I also comment about some efficiencies you can gain and prices you pay. Uh, if I remember to comment on that. But you also need a, an infrastructure in parallel for supporting the meshes. You need an infrastructure for adapting the meshes. And you need an infrastructure for constantly load balancing. I've uh, uh, been impressed with the number of questions of people recognizing, wait a minute, you, you can't do any of this if you're not load balancing all the time. And dynamic load balancing is a critical aspect of this. You're, you're out to lunch if you can't dynamically load balance and figure out how to do it pretty quickly. And that is a one of the areas that requires a lot of, of, of additional work. So the, the approach taken here is to assume that there is a high level definition of the domain. That high level definition of the domain, even if it comes from uh, image data, will ultimately have an understanding of topology as in uh, geometric models. Uh, we typically use non-manifold representations as in the uh, radial edge type of data structures, which simply allow us to deal with various types of multi-material, various types of mixed dimension models in a consistent manner. Uh, and that's long before you have the mesh. That's a higher level representation. All the problem information is defined in terms of that representation. Uh, 
in depending on the implementations and the implementation that we talk that I talk about that we do at Rensselaer we represent that as a specific thing uh, the topology of that uh, as described yesterday with Moab that can, is, uh, Tim maps that typically to mesh sets to be able to house the relationships that are the specific relationships necessary because if I apply a boundary condition on a face of a model I'm ultimately ultimately going to want to collect the set of mesh faces or if it's a Dirichlet boundary condition really the vertices on the closure of that face. Um, the mesh itself as already explained is a topological hierarchy of uh, regions, faces, edges and vertices. We can avoid the complications that we need in the geometric model of both the use structures and the concepts of loops and shells simply because of the simpler topology that you have with meshes. So we have a geometric model, we're going to have a distributed mesh and we have for managing that distributed mesh we refer to it as a, a partition model. It's an, I, the idea of how do I account for the interactions. Is this a laser pointer I hope? Yes. So the, what, between parts, of course, you're ultimately going to have to do coordination between them. If the parts are in this, on, a, on an individual node, they're going to be in the shared memory, but you still need to decide who's in charge of working on things if you're dealing with it in a partition sense as opposed to low-level threading. If there are across different parts, uh, different nodes, then you have to also control the communications in addition to uh, controlling ownership and that is the responsibility of what we refer to as a partition model within this infrastructure. Um, so the, within that infrastructure, and I'm going to skip, I'm going to go fairly quickly on a lot of this material. I'll be happy during the hands-on session, anybody has detailed questions, and we also will have, there's also pointers. Uh, you'll see that we're going to point you to some Redmine information, and the Redmine has lists of publications also that that go into details of this, uh, the, this work, but there's how you control the partition model, what are these partition entities, again, it's a, we treat it as a topology of, of entities for being able to understand the communication infrastructure. So what are key tools you need? Well, if I'm changing the mesh and I need to rebalance, I need mechanisms to move stuff around. The mesh got finer over here, I need to move some elements somewhere else because I don't want this thing to have three times the load of somebody else. I want everybody to have the same load. So you need generalized mesh migration capabilities within this that will move things, update the partition model, reconnect everything together. Um, so that's one of the, uh, a, a very key functional service that's provided. Uh, as uh, already mentioned in, in uh, several uh, different contexts, but specifically Tim talked about it with respect to supporting the unstructured meshes. You would often like ghosting and there's generalized ghosting support as defined through the ITAPS interfaces of uh, bridge element entities as to what well, entities that you want to be ghosted, the bridge entity defining the topology that will define the, what you want to ghost and how many layers of those you would like to have. Right? Now in terms of some of the research developments that are ongoing, our original work on this was strictly MPI based um, in terms of a one level of partitioning uh, and looking at how to go to machines where you need to take advantage of threading on the node. There's a couple of different options. Because of the complexities of mesh adaptation, that is a highly conditional set of software. Uh, it's very hard to do low level threading. So our approach to uh, uh, taking advantage of threading is actually to try to hide that and do a two level of partitioning where we'll have partition to the nodes and then on nodes partition again and simply account for the fact that when we're on a particular node we don't have to duplicate information we simply have to realize that only the owner can do certain operations. The uh, non-owner cannot. Um, and, and, the, you know, and so they, you have to coordinate that. Um, but we just save the, uh, the issues of uh, communication. And that's actually within the infrastructure. So the user doesn't necessarily have to know about that. By the way, we'd, the user probably wants to take advantage of it. 
but not have to know that, oh, it's a carrying out threading operations here through open MP or whichever you, mechanism you choose and using MPI here, it simply knows, oh, there's partition boundaries. Um, now, how well this will work, we have very preliminary experiments on that, and clearly, uh, by not just doing a straight MPI, which you can do, you can do the, the, the on-node MPI, but by putting this threading library, by having our, our communication library decide when it's threading and when it's doing MPI, we, we're picking up on the average of about 20% uh, to 30% speed up due to that. Um, dynamic load balancing, this has come up several times. Uh, you know, various procedures do an excellent job of giving you load balance. Um, and for those of you that, that are not familiar with the issue, when you see something like this, and there's, I think this has 200,000 points on it, or, or no, 130,000 or whatever, um, you don't really care that you've got outliers that are lightly loaded, a few of those. What you care about is anybody up here that's above the top. The peaks kill. You know, if I've got 300,000 processors and 10 of them do nothing, I don't care. I care when one of them wants to do 5% more work than the other 130,000. So, and that, that's a very important aspect of, of some of the, the thoughts and some of our algorithm details that I'll get to in, in, as I go along here. Now, in terms of load balancing, so here's a load balancing pipeline. The, the basic load balancing pipeline is you have an interface of the application. You partition the data by defining what is going to define either your graph or your geometric information for partitioning. I'll get to that in a moment. You then distribute the data. You carry out your computation. You're set. Now, in an adaptive environment, well, we're going to, after we've done that computation, we're going to develop, in, uh, calculate the indicators. You saw in the last presentation, there was discussion of, okay, where do we put the finer meshes and how? What we're going to do is need to do similar types of things. We've got to look at solution information and decide where and how we want to improve the mesh. You carry that out, and you've got to come back here and restructure this and redistribute the data. Now, if you want to do this well, you need to try to make sure you do this all in this pipeline without taking the stuff out of the parallel structures or in and putting them back in something else and going back and forth. You've got to figure out how to do it quickly. Um, and you want to keep the cost of redistributing the data low. That actually is going to dominate the process. Now, in the work we're doing, well, okay, so, so this is just a comparison of, of static, so initial uh, partitioning versus dynamic. And I've already mentioned most of these. You must carry out everything in, in uh, parallel on the structures you already have. You really want this to scale quite well, which is not an easy uh, proposition. You'd like to have easy-to-use interfaces for that. Um, and you would like to, when you can, account for if the changes are small by not just moving everything everywhere, but just moving a little bit. Now, in our work, we make very heavy use of the Zoltan partitioners. Uh, Zoltan is uh, a, a package that's being coordinated through Sandia National Labs. Karen Devine is the, the primary contact on that. And that includes a variety of partitioning algorithms in that, both geometrically based, things like recursive bisection methods and space filling curves, and, and graph based methods, standard graph uh, types of partitioners, and hypergraph partitioners, in which you can add additional information to the graph structure to account for more types of communication, data motion cost, if you will, is what typically is being done with the hypergraph methods. So the geometric partitioners, such as recursive bisection and space filling curves, have the advantage of they are fairly straightforward to understand. Uh, you do not need to have full connectivity information. You just need some ge geometric, if you will, spatial key on that. Um, you, they're typically quite fast to do. Their disadvantage is they don't explicitly give you a handle on communications. They can easily uh, develop disconnected uh, uh, subdomains. By the way, so can the graph part The graph partitioners can also give you disconnected, but not as frequently. Um, and you, you need geometry information, but that's usually not a problem. 
And in fact, in some cases, like particle-based methods, you don't really have connectivity, you just have spatial information. Topologically based uh, types of procedures take whatever information you want, and I'll touch on this a little bit more, but you're going to define a graph. You're going to have certain things that are going to be distributed. So it might be your finite elements. It might be the vertices in the mesh. You decide what you want to distribute it. There are going to be nodes in the graph, and edges will be accounting for whatever interactions, no edges in the graph will account for whatever interactions in the calculations you are concerned with. So it would be neighboring elements typically in a finite element. Uh, well, in a face-based finite volume procedure, it would be volume, the, uh, volumes that touch each other. Uh, if it's a, a first-order finite element method, it would be all the, the things coming into a vertex. This element is interacting with those because it shares degrees of freedom, et cetera. You define the graphs from there. They typically have the advantage of producing higher quality partitions, uh, more explicit control of the communications. Uh, there are a whole series of tools available. Uh, many, if not all of these, are available through the Zoltan interfaces. Uh, so you can get Zoltan and, and experiment with the different techniques. Uh, the disadvantage is they are more expensive uh, and they require uh, that you have explicit information of your dependencies, which, for example, in a particle-based method is, is not so obvious. Right. Now, I mentioned uh, the issue of the graph, and I, I'm going to uh, go very, very quickly on this, but if you're particularly interested, this partitioning using mesh adjacencies is actually part of Cameron Smith's PhD work, and Cameron is going to be uh, uh, doing much of the hands-on session, so if you find this topic interest, you can talk to him. But the idea here is, well, what do we, how do we construct the graph for the graph-based partitioner? I look at my mesh data structure and I look at my topological adjacencies. What elements are bar bonding, which, uh, you know, what have what other elements as neighbors or which ones are using these vertices or which ones are using these edges or whatever based on what I want to do. Well, if I've already got that, the way I look at it is the mesh topology is a graph. It's just a much nastier graph. It's a graph that has multiple types of entities and multiple types of relationships depending on how I want to structure those, can I directly use that, if you will, graph to control partitioning? So the idea is, well, it's very easy for me now to account for multiple element types. And I'll give you a specific example of why that, where that uh, becomes important. Um, I can avoid the graph construction process. I've already got this big data structure. You know, I'm, I'm already eating the fact that I got a big data structure, relatively speaking. You know, that's the price you pay on unstructured meshes is a much larger data structure. Um, it happens to be very easy to use with diffusive methods, which is also its disadvantage because diffusive methods, if you have to do a lot of motion, take a long time. Uh, so the, uh, you know, the, the issue of how you use this effectively is one that we're working on and how can we use more global information but still do it efficiently as opposed to totally uh, local, and, and Cameron, uh, when he's got that all answered, I'll sign his thesis, <laughs> along with the rest of the committee. <laughs> um, so applications to date is partition improvement to account for multiple element types in a solver, also for using improvement on really big meshes. Um, I mentioned yesterday we've done things up to 92 billion elements on Mira. Well, there was pain associated with that. Uh, some of the partitioners get a little upset when you try to tell it to deal with a 92 billion element mesh. So we play some games, and Parma is one of the, part of one of the games we play in making all the stuff work together. It's various combinations of global and local partitioning, et cetera, and I'm not going to go into, but um, it'd be nice if it was a little, it was, it was cleaner, but you know, when, you're, when you're pushing the limits uh, the first time through, you've got to do stuff with that. The idea of the multi-criteria uh, partitioning is you look at what mesh entities may be important. So if I think about a linear finite element method, and I'm going to do a solve on that, well, when I'm setting up the equations, it's the elements that are very important to me. I want to balance the number of elements. But when I'm solving, I want to balance, when I'm solving the linear equations, I want to balance the degrees of freedom. Well, linear finite elements, degrees of freedom are associated with the vertices. I want to balance the vertices then. So if I run my graph partitioner, 
a graph partitioner might do an excellent job of the regions, but then I might have imbalances, and we've seen them, 20% on the vertices. Now, the nice thing is it's 20% on the vertices for 20, well, for less than 1%, usually of a point one, on the order of 0.1% of the, the regions are really, uh, of the, 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 the parts of the mesh are really out of bounds. Um, and so those we uh, want to, to do something about. Um, now, if it was a second order finite element method where I happen to be using uh, edge degrees of freedom, well, then I'm also concerned about the degrees of freedom in the edge. So I would be concerned about balancing the regions, balancing the vertices, balancing the edges. And probably the vertices are a little bit, and the edges are of equal importance because the solve is more expensive than the formation, and I'm less concerned about the regions. So I'm going to do this go through this improvement of a partition. And the way we've done it so far is we get a good partition from, from Zoltan, and then we say, OK, what is it not doing for the other entities, and let's improve those. And what type of difference does it make? So here's an example. Uh, and you see, here's a typical outlier, you know, which might be, I can't re, uh, that's, yeah, 14% imbalance in the vertex. So that's, that's problematic when we're running, you know, uh, this is a, 16,000 parts on it, that, that would really slow things down. So what I want to do is knock that down. We knock it down to 5%. Now, in doing that, I'll increase the element imbalance, but not by that much. So I put a little bit more noise in the elements to knock down these spikes by doing this diffusive method by looking at the adjacency information directly. And what is that, what is that done? Well, it, basically gave us a 10% increase in our strong scaling. Strong scaling went from uh, 0.8 to 0.9 um, in, these, uh, uh, in these runs. Another thing we found relatively important is the idea of predictive load balancing. And in fact, the predictive load balancing came up and bit, bit us when we started working on the IBM SP2, so that's how long ago we had to decide we'd do something about predictive load balancing. And this is in the case of adaptive analysis. I've got a certain number of parts on a mesh that's perfectly balanced. I do my error estimation. It tells me make the mesh much finer here, maybe make it a little coarser there, whatever. And I start carrying that out on that partition. And what I end up with is I end up with some parts with lots and lots of elements. Well, what's, why is that so problematic? Well, the first thing that's problematic about that, forget about load balance. Hell, I'm, you know, I'll be, you know, I'd, I'd be happy if it run, because it didn't run. It ran out of memory. So the idea of predictive load balancing is, well, I've done my error estimation. I know what I'm going to be doing to the mesh. So I'm going to use that information in this particular case, because we work with a generic anisotropic mesh size field. I use that information to assign weights to the elements. So I take a well-balanced mesh, and I make it unbalanced before I adapt, and then I adapt, and instead of getting nasty spikes, I just get a little bit of stuff here. And by the way, the next challenge for Parma is say, OK, take this mesh and fix it so I don't have to go through a total repartitioning. I just even these out. OK, so those are some of the underlying tools and methods in that uh, for the mesh infrastructure. Now, how do we actually carry out adaptation? There's a variety of approaches. The methods that will be demonstrated today in the tools we've developed use a very generalized mesh modification operations, which have the flexibility of it allows us to easily support anisotropic mesh adaptation. Many, many problems have stronger gradients in one direction than the other. I don't want always isotropic elements. I want isotropic elements in the physics so if I've got 10 times a gradient in this direction, I really would like an element 10 times longer because I want it to have as, as much change this way as that way, if you will. So we, we want anisotropy. They can easily support that. They can deal with domain complexities of, oh, getting onto the curve geometry or even ge geometric simplification. I won't touch on that today. That's a, a fun issue. Um, you can get whatever accuracy you want. and you can uh, transfer the solution as you're carrying out the mesh modification operations, as opposed to doing a total global remesh and have to mesh uh, solutions from one mesh to another. I might be able to do this more uh, quickly and a little bit more accurately if I happen to know I'm doing local operations, because a subdivision, 
going to be exact. A collapse, well, okay, but my error is, at least, is you know, not exact, but at least I'm not, uh, you know, I'm doing it very localized in terms of how I can control that. So we control this with an anisotropic mesh metric field, uh, and we care, basically look at the mesh, decide what we want to carry out, and carry that out. Let me just show a picture. So there's, there's basic operations of swap, collapse, split, uh, and move ver uh, things. Now, a key aspect of this is you cannot just carry out these operations singly. You have to have more complex logic that looks at various combinations of these based on what your goal is and what your constraints are. So if I'm trying to do something and I want to make it finer but I don't want to make a flat element, I would do a different thing than if I want to make a flat element, et cetera. Uh, and the, so the key to make this successful is you, you have to have a fair amount of additional logic in the decision process. In addition, since you're, we're doing it this way, ideas of making sure that when we adapt the mesh, we pull things to the boundary can be done as you're doing it. And not only that, as you pull it to the boundary, half the time, thing, when, whenever you've got concave parts, and you're always going to have them somewhere, things will turn inside out on you. Well, you can see that's going to happen. Don't allow it to begin with. Do a mesh modification that gets the stuff out of the way so you can get the things there. Typically, a combined split collapse operation is what's needed for such things. And you know, that's, if I went into detail, I'd explain in this table, and you see there's a whole bunch of different operations that need to be carried out uh, to carefully do this. It's not just moving. You can't just move because things turn inside out all the time. Right? Um, when we are dealing with problems with high anisotropy, often those are either at boundaries or on internal surfaces such as a shear layer, or even at a shock we're finding it's advantageous to do. It's nice to have some semi-structured type of mesh support in there. So of course the, you know, the mesh infrastructure can deal with various types of element uh, capability types, and we have the solvers deal with various types of elements. Uh, which need to be a little bit more complex to deal with, also include pyramids and hexes, etc. cetera. Um, these same techniques have been extended to deal with curved elements. A lot of additional complication when you deal with curved elements, which if, you, if you're doing uh, a higher order method, you have to improve your geometric approximation. Otherwise, you're, conver you're converging to the solution to the wrong problem. I'm not really analyzing some facet thing, I'm analyzing some curve thing. So I need to have my order of geometric approximation as good as the discretization uh, that I'm using. So if I'm using quadratic uh, shape functions, I have to have at least quadratic geometry. Um, so you've got issues of what is a shape measure, you've got issues of, oh, I have much, much more complex mesh modification operations now. I'm not just thinking about what is a valid straight-sided element and a good decision to make on that, but gee, I can curve things now, so what's the, the logic for doing that? And if I really want to go further with higher order methods on things like elliptic problems, I really have to do very specialized mesh generation other, uh, to really get the power of these methods. Um, to get the exponential convergence rates that are potentially possible with them. Right? So how do we parallelize these concepts? Well, parallelization of the mesh adaptation, there's a couple of different uh, approaches. The approach that we use when you're doing refinement is fairly straightforward because there's control and the communication through the partition model. We let each side do its job so long as we do it in a way that we know it will do the same work. And then when it's done, we do a, there's communication done to coordinate to say, okay, uh, this, this new thing is really the same as that new thing. These new edges are those the same as that. Now, for uh, something like a collapse operation, that's more complex. The concept fairly simple. You say, if I want to carry out a collapse operation that involves these elements on four parts, no, no, I'm not going to uh, yeah, fool around trying to do all that logic over all those parts just send messages, say, migrate this stuff over to this part, and uh, once I'm on one part, I'll do that local mesh modification operation. Now, what do we do when we have boundary layers? Because when we have boundary layers and we're adapting the boundary layers, we do not want to destroy the 
the semi-structured nature of the boundary layers. And in our particular case, we happen to use some of the, the mesh set concepts that Tim was talking about yesterday, and we keep these stacks in, 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 uh, uh, in sets and all, all insist that those sets are always on a part to be able to carry that out. So an entire stack's always on a part, so I always know that I'm going to be able to carry out the uh, ability to keep that semi-structured. So this is just a picture of a mesh being adapted. Um, and these meshes have combinations of, in this particular case, wedges, pyramids, and tetrahedron. You need the pyramids because there's times uh, where you have different number of layers changing. Because when if, if you start adapting, all of a sudden you find the, the boundary layer becomes somewhat isotropic. You want to take it out of the boundary layer because you don't want to end up with an anisotropy in the wrong direction. Um, this idea of anisotropy is easily controlled with this concept of a mesh metric. You can think of it geometrically as what are the uh, a axes lengths for an ellipse, and the, this metric talks about a transformation to a sphere. Uh, when you're in the boundary layer, because we want to separate what we do in the plane of the surface, if you will, the curvilinear surface, uh, as opposed to the quasi-normal direction, we simply decompose that metric in that direction to define those two things. So this is just a, a, an aerodynamics example of an initial mesh, an adapted mesh. Uh, this is showing at the boundary layer. Uh, but more interesting is looking at, or excuse me, this is showing a mesh on the surface. But this is a mesh with a boundary layer. So this just happens to be somewhere along the wing. You see there's this boundary layer, originally a pretty isotropic mesh, which is not a good approximation for what you want here, you can see it's becoming quite anisotropic on the surface, but we're maintaining as we adapt it the structure of the boundary layer. Same thing used in other applications such as flow applications, and this same tool was used. This is the example for the 92 billion element problems run on the, the, the full mirror system of uh, a problem that I can't tell you any of the detail about because it happens to actually be for a company. Right. So how do, are, are we trying to use this to deal with applications? Um, and this will probably be the, the weirdest looking picture you'll ever see of a simulation environment because the big thing on this picture happens to be the parallel infrastructure for the mesh. But from a data standpoint, it is probably the dominant thing in carrying out a simulation workflow is how do you control that interaction. So let me describe a little about this overall picture. So we have a high level description of the problem. There's some input domain definition. It might be a CAD model. It might be something worse than that. And I'll give you an example of that. We also have information about the physics to be solved, model parameters that are, we're assuming will be associated with that domain definition. We need to make sure that domain definition is in a form that all our discretization processes can actually interact with them. Very often, this thing is lacking. We need to do some work to construct a, a complete non-manifold model representation of that. And that domain in, in, uh, is going to be interacted with, with the parallel mesh infrastructure, which is going to keep a copy of the domain topology. I don't have the time to explain why we actually want to keep a copy of that there. But we want to keep a copy of that there. Uh, and then you're also going to have your mesh topology and control uh, and partition control, your dynamic load balancing as key tools in here. They're going to create the input needed for the analysis process. The analysis process is going to associate information back to the mesh, because the mesh is the, con the thing that's controlling. And solution information is of a variety of types. It's associated with different mesh entities. I carry out a finite elements solution, and I'll have primary variables evaluated at vertices and secondary variables evaluated at integration points. So those integration points are actually associated with the mesh regions. And as Tim described yesterday, one specific mechanism you can use is the tagging types of capabilities to, to maintain the relationship back to that. Now, that information is going to go through some type of error estimation, correction indication procedures, you're also going to uh, 
in that go up and do mesh uh, adaptation and or regeneration of some form, uh, initial mesh generation and mesh adaptation as you get done. And as you're doing the mesh adaptation, we're also going to need with solution transfer, so we have stuff passing through here. Uh, in the methods I've been talking about, what's here is always a generic mesh size field, but it could be something different. Now, a key aspect of this is we're often asked to do this with existing finite volume and finite element packages. And they are used to reading stuff from files. And running adaptive loops where everything goes through files is really uh, not a highly, well, the, that part becomes a bottleneck, put it pretty simply. Um, typically on the order of 50% of our total time spent, uh, allocations in an Insight grant was spent doing I.O. on the first Insight grant we had. Um, so we have developed, and, and uh, again, this is an actual camera and can explain this in detail, because he was sort of the key person on developing this in-memory capability, where what we do is we go, instead of trying to go into the analysis package and, and totally rip out its data structures, um, which simply is not going to get done. It takes too long. We find out where they do their I.O., because that's always pretty localized. And instead of reading the file, we say, what are you information are you actually loading into your data structures? And we will we'll write API functions to our data to give you your data. So now the price you're going to pay is we're going to have some duplicate data for a little while, but you can throw that, some of that out, some of it you want to keep because you don't want to have to recover it later, such as some of the mesh topology. But you, you basically go in and you can uh, do this by only modifying a bit of the software. The other aspect of that is, the reality is, is any time we've worked with a DOE, any of the DOE applications or anybody else, we don't tell them about this first. We tell them, oh, we can construct an adaptive loop and we don't have to change anything in your program. And what we'll do is we'll write our software using APIs to our data to read their file in and to write their files. And then when they say that's a damn bottleneck, we'll say, well, if you let us go in and change just this part of your program. <laughs> and the reason we do it that way is because if it was every time we went in and said, let us change this part of your program to begin with, they went like this, get out of here, get out of here, don't, you don't touch our program. It, 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 Lori talked about trust uh, in, last night you got to get their trust before they'll let you monkey around with their stuff. <laughs> um, so that, you know, that was one of the lessons learned, and, uh, it, it, one of the reasons we typically like to come in this way when we finally do do that. All right, so some examples of, that, that, uh, of this type. Uh, one is an active flow control calculation where the, the input uh, is a, is a, happens to typically be a solid model, a parasolid type of model, which is a good complete one to begin with. The math being solved here is Navier-Stokes with turbulence models, or finite element discretizations in that. FOSTA is this code that's gone to 92 billion elements that, uh, with good strong scaling. We have anisotropic mesh correction procedures, including uh, doing, and in fact, I should amend this, with now with physics-based control of the thickness adaptation in the boundary layer. You actually want the boundary layer to get taller or shorter. Um, automatic solution transfer as you're doing that. And in terms of the specific tool, PUMI is this collection of tools of a, me of a specific mesh infrastructure, uh, database infrastructure, partition model, uh, ghosting algorithms, migration procedures, et cetera, that have been put together uh, GMI happens to be our geometry interface, very similar to what Tim was talking about. Uh, this particular one is limited to just geometric interrogations. I can only ask questions of an existing model. Um, so FMDB is the actual mesh database with its partition model. We're using Zoltan and Parma for doing this. Uh, oh, and for the visualization, I, I'm sorry, I skipped the visualization. You're always going to see pair of you listed in ours just because uh, the president of Kitware was my student, so you know I've got to use Paraview. Uh, you know, but it, this could just as easily be visit. <laughs> okay, good. Um, I just about right. I'll have to rush a little. So this is just some scaling results with FOSTA and anisotropic adapted mesh for uh, a modeling of an aneurysm. Here's the actual the the uh, the active flow control. We have these synthetic jets, these actuators. 
The idea here is you blow air out of this and you effectively change the shape of the airfoil to increase its efficiency. Some of them are very useful for dealing with uh, wind turbines. Uh, also, well, I can't, well, other applications of which I can't really mention what they are, but I can mention the wind turbine one. So, you know, you get gusts if you have the actuators uh, there, you can decrease the load during gusts and have a more optimum shape when it's low wind. Uh, we've also worked on other aerodynamic simulations for NASA. So there the analysis code is a, uh, the FUN3D finite volume code solving Navier-Stokes. Within that they have goal-oriented error estimators which are very sophisticated within that. In this uh, we're either using Parasolid or Geosim which is just uh, well, uh, uh, the reason we're starting to use Geosim, and Geosim comes from this company called Symmetrics, is that we can run Geosim on the IBM Blue Gene Q, uh, uh, whereas Paris, uh, where the commercial CAD modelers won't run on, on the Blue Gene Q. And if you want to run on a Cray, you can run Parasol on a Cray, but you might want to, you know, you might uh, have uh, more licensing issues than you have with others. So you're going to see in some of these, it's going to either be Puma and or Symmetrics. And in fact, in some of the applications, we're going back and forth between the two because we happen to like to use the Symmetrics mesh generators, especially for large initial meshes, since they can generate meshes in parallel, uh, meshes of, in a, of a billion elements in under an hour on 64 cores, for example, um, on, on arbitrary geometries. Uh, so that's comments there on that, and this is just an application to a scramjet uh, Mach 6 type of flow. Uh, back to FOSTA, in this case using, uh, doing a two-phase flow, so the new thing added here is some level set capabilities, and we're doing anisotropic adaptivity to the level sets, as you can see uh, in the picture there. Uh, with the people at Slack, we are, uh, the input is an ASIS model. Uh, again, we can use either the, 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 the open source of the commercial tools and whatever combinations we want. It's the ACE3P software from Slack, which is an electromagnetic. It's the edge-based type of, of finite element methodologies. And this has been used for various accelerator types of applications, these accelerators uh, look nasty enough from the outside, but when you get on the inside, they're even nastier yet. There's all sorts of things within that. Uh, they're now moving, uh, so the extensions passed just doing the electromagnetics. The first one was the doing adaptation where you're also combining with particle methods, and now they're doing multi-physics analysis with both heat transfer and structures in there using some of these same technologies. Finally, I want to talk about the more recent work we're doing with the Albany Multiphysics Code that saw, uh, really targets a number of object objectives. It's a finite element-based code, or if you will, unstructured mesh-based code. Uh, it's a, a development environment uh, built, uh, with a uh, variety of building blocks. They have mechanisms to describe. Uh, drive and demonstrate the agile components that have been built into Trilinos and Albany and themselves. It uses generic programming methodologies. Um, it's a good demonstration. Well, uh, it's listed here as a demonstration application. We're trying to push it much past that. We're actually using that for a project now with IBM uh, where IBM's not going to be happy if we just call it a demonstration application by the time we're done. Um, but it's using 98 different uh, Sandia, package, uh, Sandia packages within that to get stuff done. It's an open source capability so that anybody that's interested in that, and Glenn Hansen is the person to talk to on that. He's sitting in the back and will be up here uh, for the hands-on session describing a little bit of what's done there. So this is just an overall picture of it where we've, well, this is a picture of it that Glenn made when we're, you know, emphasizing some of the things we're integrating in with it for, to support adaptivity but there's a lot more to the, the capabilities in Albany for doing analyses as well as operations such as uh, uncertainty quantification and optimization, which are of course becoming increasingly more important. This is another picture showing some of the, the specific things within that some of the physics supported, some of the infrastructures it I interacts with uh, for getting uh, mesh data, for example. 
Right? So here's one instantiation of how we're using it in this work we're doing for IBM where they want to do multi-billion element meshes of certain integrated circuit problems. Uh, and this, uh, obviously they'd like us running this on an IBM Blue Gene Q. I, I'm not quite sure I can figure out why they want to pick that machine, but IBM said they try to do it on the Q. Uh, an interesting wrinkle on this is the input is really lousy. The input is GDS2 layout files. GDS2 layout files are very simplified geometry, fully 2D. You have to infer from process information the 3D geometry, and you also have to infer that those shapes are not really the shapes you're going to end up with. Those are as designed, not as processed, and you really want to analyze for performance the as processed. Um, so there's lots of rules to modify the geometry. So we are developing a tool to take this information modify it to really what it should look like, and construct a solid model, uh, initially in parasolid, but because we want, we're going to run this, uh, and these, these, these models, by the way, have millions of pieces to them, so the geometry is going to have to be in parallel, and since GeoSim can support parallel geometry, we're jumping directly to this GeoSim software uh, for the geometry, and again, it's a combination of this Pumi and, and the GeoSim stuff for controlling the interactions with Albany Trilinos doing the analysis work on that. So this is just a simple example. This is, you know, uh, IBM gave us and some details on that, and I'm uh, good. So in this in this problem, we do have to generate the initial mesh in parallel with the the, the parallel geometry. I'm not going to go into detail of that. I will tell you that parallel mesh gener if you think parallel scalability of parallel solution is a pain, scalability of parallel mesh adaptation is really a pain, and scalability of parallel mesh generation starting from a CAD model is much worse, and I can give you a simple reason why. Anytime you parallelize, you have to have a structure to parallelize from. Well, okay, so the, for the adaptivity and for the analysis, I got the mesh. Well, if I'm generating the mesh, I can't use the mesh to parallelize the operation. Right, and all those that say they're doing parallel mesh generation that start with a mesh to begin with are cheating by the definition we use of it, because I have to start from a CAD model and figure out how to do it in parallel. Well, there's, there's software that does that. Um, and just as just a simple example, and uh, I think it's a 16-part uh, structural mechanics problem done with Albany and adapted. Okay, in terms of some of the hands-on exercise, I'm going to do this very quickly because uh, uh, Cameron and Glenn are going to go through the red mine pages that they've been put together and tell you more about that as the hands-on exercise starts uh, in just, oh, I think there's a clock up here, so I know I'm running out of time. Um, but you, you'll see a result of doing this mesh generation on an aerodynamics problem with an actuator geometry in that. You'll see partitioning with both uh, graph-based and uh, uh, geometric partitioning. You'll see adapting the mesh, in this case, to some pre-specified, from one mesh to another that happens to be pre-specified, but it could also be done adaptively. Uh, the tools that will be used in that, you'll see meshes being adapted from a few hundred thousand elements up to into several million elements. Uh, you, you can visualize it, how well the visualization is going to run uh, uh, you probably won't be able to run the visualization. It'll probably clog up the system, but the camera will explain more on that. Um, then there'll also be discussions of the Albany capabilities, uh, a little bit about the the uh, adaptive control in that, but also, Glenn, you're going to mention some of the issues of uh, options for preconditioning in that, I believe. Okay. So, there's, you, know, the, you know, I've skipped all the stuff of all the headaches in the solver, Glenn will mention that, oh, yeah, you have to remember there's the solver needs to do stuff. All right, so the, the last few slides here are simply, and you, have, you guys have to get copies of these. So this is just listing the, some of the specific tools we're using, where you can get the software, and where you get more information. And the same information is available in the software uh, thing, so I can skip that. But there's Pumi, there's Zoltan, there's Parma, there's Mesh Adapt, and Albany within that. Thank you very much.
Well, okay. Uh, I would only use element deletion for damage models. I would not use that for crack propagation. For crack propagation, I can show you some really nice stuff that Symmetrics has done. Um, and the predictive load balancing for that would be harder. The reason it would be harder is that it's a larger local remesh that's done. But they actually have the capability of having the cracks move through the 3D geometry. As it's moving through the 3D geometry, you blow away the mesh, let it go right through elements. It doesn't have to follow element boundaries. It goes wherever it wants and where it stops. Then you have a very well-structured mesh in a preserve. Actually, GE is using this on a daily basis for jet engine design. Um, and they're using 1970s finite element technology. And the key to getting that to be accurate is having the mesh perfectly aligned with the methodology they do for calculating crack tip opening modes. So it has to be very carefully laid out right near the crack tip, and then you do your transitions in that. So no, I don't support that. But if I were to support that, what I simply need is, you saw that simple equation, I need the equivalent of that to say what's likely to be happening there so I end up with about the right number of elements. And then what's going to happen is that's never going to be perfect by that prediction because I've not got to deal with geometric complexities and everything else. My fix-up afterwards may be even a little tougher than it is with just the, the straight adaptation. Okay, I'm sorry. So the, the, the question has to do with, um, I, I'm going to paraphrase, and if I screw it up, just tell me I screwed it up. But as we go to exascale, it's going to be even more difficult than it is now to do all this fully unstructured stuff that we do. So what is, have we started thinking about what is the right level of combinations of structured and unstructured types of capabilities you may want to do um, for that? And my answer is no, we've not looked at that. And I agree that at some point that's probably something that should be looked at. But at least for my specific group, I have a very, very sp specific philosophy. I'm always going to deal with the fully unstructured situation and try to take that as far as we can so I can deal with any level of geometric complexity or anything else. So until I get that as far as I can on an exascale machine, I'm probably not going to say, well, what can I do with more semi-structured stuff? But maybe some of you guys might get to the, uh, help us and, and address that question. I, I do believe there's probably some important issues there that could be uh, taken specific advantage of. Certainly, if I wanted to use some of the current accelerators, I would have to do something like that. 